Let us pray. We give you thanks, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have this day so graciously protected us. We beg you to forgive us all our sins and the wrong which we have done. By your great mercy, defend us from all the perils and dangers of this night. Into your hands we commend our bodies and souls and all that is ours. Let your holy angels have charge of us, that the wicked one have no power over us. Amen. Luther's Evening Prayer. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Lutheran Beliefs and Practices. First of all, I need to correct a huge mistake that I made last week right away when I said that one of the chief sources I would be using, and indeed the chief source of Lutheran theology, is the Book of Common Prayer. No offense to my Episcopal colleagues, but it is the Book of Concord. I guess I'm still a little camera shy. It is the Book of Concord that is the principal source for the Lutheran Confessions, Doctrine, Theology, Practice. Along today with uh, Fortress's Introduction to Lutheranism by Eric Grinch, which is also a classic and very important uh, book explaining what we believe. The Book of Concord is the only defined collection of Lutheran confessions that is recognized today. So if you're interested in learning more, digging deeper, this is a good book to have on your shelf. Uh, it explains um, a lot and uh, I can order it for you or you can order it off of Amazon. Um, it's put out by Augsburg Fortress. The church exists to live by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. As Lutheran Christians living by grace through faith, we are called to include, to invite, to forgive all those who seek to come. For we remember there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. In that vein, we are to pray always Especially Paul reminds us of that, that our whole life is a life of prayer. And it doesn't always mean folding your hands and bowing your head. But it just means to live that life in confidence in Christ. That Christ has forgiven me. Christ has saved me. Christ is my Savior. Christ is the worker. Christ is the bridegroom. Uh, so we are to be in that constant relationship. That prayerful relationship. Not only... Uh, official acts of prayer, not only us doing the talking, but listening, listening for that still small voice, listening for God's direction, God's leading, God's comforting, God's forgiving, God's encouraging, to be in that relationship, that communion with Jesus, so important. We are to set people free. We talked a little bit about that Last week, as uh, we read from Matthew, we are to set people free. We are to bring them that freeing word of the gospel, that you are claimed by God. You are a child of God, not because of what you've done or didn't do or are yet to do, but just because. So we are to bring that liberating message to all that we meet. Set people free. Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked visit the prisoners. We are to take action. When there is a need, we are to respond. We take action in various and different ways through our offerings to ELCA, which enables those people on our behalf to take action. And if you're interested in that type of thing, you can go to the ELCA webpage and learn all about all of the activity that happens on our behalf as we uh, give our offerings to Synod and to Churchwide. But also we take action locally. Um, we feed people uh, through the farm that we have out here, Feed Iowa First. Also through the Marion Food Pantry 
and other many and various ways. We take action with our children, ensuring that they know the stories of Jesus, that they have received the instruction needed and necessary for them to move on into adulthood. We support Iwalu uh, Bible Camp and other various ways for our youth. We are to expect surprises. Perhaps the biggest surprise is, is uh, navigating through this pandemic. And it doesn't always uh, mean that the surprises are wrong or bad, but it is a surprise that Jesus is always with us, always here. Just one more surprise, as the old uh, hymn reminds us. And we are to be hopeful. We are people of hope. We are people of confident trust that come what may, God will see us through as we plant our feet in the promises of the gospel, which was what's so important to Martin Luther and all the followers of the church. We are to be hopeful, to work for that and pray for that promised better day when all people will be saved. We ought to know down in our Lutheran souls that when any one of us walks into a room at home or at school, in the workplace, wherever we find ourselves, Jesus is really there. God incarnate. The way to know God is to know Jesus. And Jesus is with us always, even to the end. God is at work in every single one of us, and everyone has something to offer. That priesthood of all believers that was so important to Luther worked so hard on that aspect. So ask yourself this day and throughout the week, a little bit of a homework assignment, but maybe we haven't taken time to do that for a while. Ask yourself, what are your gifts? What do you love to do? How do you like to spend your time? What do other people say you're good at? And that will form, perhaps, the spot that you can fill in the life of the congregation. Do you like to bake? Do you like to mow the grass? Do you like to paint? What do you like to do? And what do other people say you're good at? Those, perhaps, are the gifts that you can cultivate and use as an expression of God's love through you. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Use your gifts, use your talents, use your, your faith to help other people find the way. Because most of us, probably 99% of us, found our way in the faith through other people. Parents, grandparents, Sunday school teachers, pastors, youth directors, church folks and others that helped us. And that is so important. Luther says your faith is truly active through love. That is, it finds expression in works of freest service, cheerfully and lovingly done. We do good works out of response to what God has done for us. That free gift that Christ gives to us that we may give to others. We do not do good works to gain favor or merit, which was the old system. Fortress Introduction to Lutheranism by Eric Grinch. Again, another very helpful resource for your shelf. Another resource you can purchase through Augsburg Fortress. What does it mean to be Lutheran? That is a loaded question, and that there is a, you know, a thousand answers for that question. That is a question that you wrestle with uh, perhaps your whole life. What does it mean to be a Lutheran Christian? We have distinctive ways of doing things. I've always said that. There's a reason why we do what we do. And sometimes that reason uh, brings joy, and sometimes that reason brings a little bit of pain. But we have distinctive ways of doing things. 
and distinctive accents and angles of vision on belief that we share with other Christians. So Lutherans have a particular way, a peculiar way of uh, being a Christian and being in the Christian faith, which is what we're going to talk about for the next several weeks. Not eager to prove ourselves superior to other believers, we do find it important to have a grasp on these special approaches. Very important, as I said last week, to know what you know, to believe what you believe in concert with what the church believes, with what the church practices, with what the church stands for. Lutherans are Protestant, which means we protested the uh, Roman Catholic Church, who are also Catholic, small c. Small c, which means we are part of the whole church universal. As Protestants, we continue the Reformation begun in European churches in the 15th century. Being Catholic, small c, we believe that we are connected with all Christians, but we are not in fellowship with all Christians, and that's an important distinction, who stress their ties to Christ's church everywhere through the ages. The central insight of Lutheranism is that human interaction with God centers not in our achievement, but in divine grace. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith, not any kind of achievement. We're not saved because of our family background or our occupation or anything but pure grace, which uh, happens for us on the cross. God is not forced to give, and we are not forced to receive. Luther insisted that God could be God only by acting freely and spontaneously as one who shares love with people who cannot buy it or be forced to receive it or who do not deserve it. In turn, a response had to be like God's love, spontaneous and loving. Now, God loves us, period. There's nothing that we can do that he will not continue to love us for. And thankfully, we're not the judge, so that if, in fact, uh, a person does turn their back on God, God does not turn God's back on them. Faith, Luther thought, was obscured by the church of his day because people were so busy working, earning, and thinking their way into God's love. Remember his central question? What can I do? How much do I have to do? Can I ever do enough to please this angry God? They could never satisfy their quest this way. You cannot buy it. You can't go to the store. You can't earn it. You can't think your way. It is God's love free and unconditional. There was another way, faith. For Luther and Lutherans, this means chiefly a trust or confidence in the God who makes promises. Lo, I am with you always. No one will ever snatch them out of my hand. Those are two of my favorite promises of God. There's no condition there. It is free and undeserved. God is a faithful God. The Bible is a story whose plot tells of this faithful God dealing with people, and people need to respond with trust, which is the work of the Holy Spirit residing in us. The Lutheran understanding of God, Word, and Bible divides the message into law and gospel. In simplest terms, and let me underscore that word, simplest, law represents the demands of God, 
I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other, right? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Don't covet your neighbor's anything. Law represents the demands of God, and gospel is the promise of God. I have called you by name. You are mine. One of my favorite promises of God. No condition there. Nothing that you had to do to earn that. I have called you by name. You are mine. Talk a little bit about the history, and this is just a brief, and we will come back to this probably again, but just a brief overview of the history of Lutherans in North America. The Dutch Lutherans were among the first settlers in New Amsterdam, 1623 in Albany, 1625 Manhattan Island. Repressive policies of the Dutch West India Company opposition from Dutch Reformed pastors, and the antagonism of the governor made their lot extremely difficult. With New Amsterdam surrendered to the English in 1664, opposition ceased. The Swedish Lutherans settled on the Delaware River in 1638. The colony grew until there were six or more congregations. The first Lutheran church building in America was erected on Tinicum Island in 1646. Justice Faulkner, 1672 to 1723, was the first Lutheran pastor ordained in America, November 24th, 1703. He served a parish stretching from Long Island to Albany, New York. Henry Muhlenberg, which I'm sure that you have heard of in the past, 1711 to 1787, is justly called the Patriarch of the Lutheran Church of America. His labors, organizational ability, and respect for the confessions established the Lutheran Church on American soil. The Norwegians. Vast numbers of Norwegian immigrants began to reach the Midwest in the 1830s. In 1846, under the leadership of men like Elling Ellison, 18 to 1883, they organized the Evangelical Lutheran Church of North America. Later others added small synods. Today the descendants of these Norwegian pioneers are part of the former American Lutheran Church, now a part of the ELCA, and these are where my roots uh, come from. The Swedes, again, by the 1840s, the Swedes were coming into the Midwest in great numbers. Stoutly adhering to confessionalism, they established the Augustana Lutheran Church in 1860. This vigorous group became part of the former Lutheran Church in America, which is now the, Amer the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the ELCA. The Danes and the Finns, Danish and Finnish immigrants arrived in smaller numbers than other Scandinavian groups. Each nationality established congregations by the late 1860s. The Danish Lutheran Church in America was started in 1872, and the Finns organized the first Finnish Lutheran Church in America, or Suomi Synod, in 1890. The United Dutch Lutheran Church in America was established in 1896. For the most part, these are now members of the ELCA. Starting then with a little bit of history of Luther. Luther was born November 10th, 1483, and died February 18th, 1546. So this is the month that we remember Luther. Usually you remember people's death date and not their birth date when you're talking about the saints and witnesses of the church. The church at the time of Luther was Roman Catholic. It was governed by the Pope and used the sacrament of penance as the principal tool of the faith. The sacrament of penance, the sacrament of the new law instituted by Christ, and that of course is not something that we adhere to, in which forgiveness of sins committed after baptism is granted through the priest's absolution to those who with true sorrow confess their sins and promise to satisfy for the same. Let me uh, explain that a little bit. Yes, we have 
individual confession and forgiveness, which is offered um, through uh, the pastor. We also have corporate confession and forgiveness, which we use every Sunday. But you are free to confess to Christ alone. You do not need to go through the pastor unless uh, the words of the pastor comfort you more, assure you more. So on a couple of of days throughout the church year, we will have, during the worship service, the chance for people to come forward and receive individual uh, forgiveness from the pastor. But all of this is because of Christ, not because of works or in any way to uh, satisfy or to make us um, more acceptable to God through that action. Confession in the church was based on the if-then condition. If I do such and such for God, that is for the church, then I will endure less punishment, both now and after death, for the sins I commit. So there was a merit system of which I could borrow some uh, righteousness from the saints and that would help me to uh, lessen my time in purgatory the if-then condition Luther proposes a because therefore because you are saved therefore you are free to serve your neighbor who is Christ in your midst purgatory somewhere between heaven and earth it purified by means of fire all sinners on their way to eternal life. A place or condition of temporal punishment for those who, departing this life in God's grace, are not entirely free from venial faults or have not fully paid the satisfaction due to their transgression. And of course, the Church of Luther's Day held the keys and the requirements for this. It could be a year or a thousand years in purgatory. Luther's parents encouraged Luther to become a lawyer. But while on a walk in the Saxon countryside, the 21-year-old law student, who was frightened by a thunderstorm, cried out, St. Anne, help me. St. Anne is the grandmother of Jesus, and I will become a monk. She did, and he did. By the 16th century, the church was in deep trouble. Corrupt officials and misguided religious practices abused the gospel. Ignorance and superstition combined to distort truth and confuse people. Remember, most people couldn't read. All they could do was listen to what the priest had to say, how the priest interpreted life. And if you've watched the recent Luther movie, you have seen the parts of the movie where they show these incredibly ghastly pictures of people in hell. And that was the way they worked on their conscience in order to sell the indulgence, which would then, um, they could then escape purgatory. So there were, there was ignorance, and also ignorance on the part of the priest. Many of the priests uh, didn't know much about uh, theology or God either. And superstition. Even Luther wrestled with superstition. He talks about uh, the owls uh, whirling down uh, uh, barrels full of little demons in, uh, in uh, the tower where he was staying. And of course, when it got dark, there were all sorts of superstitions about uh, gnomes and fairies and things like that in the forests, right? And because just about anything during Luther's day could kill you, common cold, broken leg, any of that kind of stuff, people were very superstitious. To Luther, a professor at the University of Wittenberg fell the task of working for reform unscrupulous methods of raising money for the church projects touched off the Reformation. 
on October 31st, 1517, on the parish church door at Wittenberg, Luther nailed 95 theses or propositions for debate uh, of these troubling issues. Soon he was recognized as the leader of a sweeping reform movement. His stormy career was profoundly productive as he taught, preached, wrote books on theology, hymns, and letters of counsel, and translated the Bible into German. For the first time, also with the invention of the printing press, that helped. But for the first time, the German people could now hear the worship service in their own language. They could sing hymns in their own language. This just revolutionized. It's sort of, as I uh, say every once in a while, it blew the feast day. It took away a lot of the power from the local priest and bishop. Luther was haunted by the question, could he ever do enough to earn God's love? Would God really save him from sin? Indeed, did a gracious God exist since one only heard about a wrathful one in church? When Luther dug deeper into Holy Scripture, he rediscovered what had long been ignored. One is reconciled with God by having faith rather than by any moral effort. The one who is righteous will live by faith. Romans 1, 17. And the object of that faith is Jesus Christ alone. When Christ is the center of one's life, Luther told his students, one has the correct theology because it points to Christ as the power that comes from outside. This teaching was foreign to the teaching and practice prevalent in the church of Luther's time. Instead, the church preached, do good during the week and then come to church to add sacramental grace to your efforts to please God. Your credit, based on your natural ability to do good, will join with God's gift to make you a true child of God. There's that merit system again, that credit system. Indulgences, then, were one way that the church used, probably the principal way that the church used, to keep people in line and also to rebuild St. Peter's Cathedral. They were, permit, they were permits sold that granted forgiveness for sins not yet committed, such as eating meat on Friday. Other indulgences even promised for the payment of large sums to release deceased relatives from purgatory. People paid all they had to buy this worthless piece of paper that ensured that their mom or dad was free from purgatory. John Tetzel, one of the figures named in the Reformation, his uh, slogan, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. October 31st, then, is an important day in the life of the church, in the history of the church, for that is the day that Luther posted his 95 Theses on the door. Luther was not an innovator, but rather a defender of the ancient Christian teachings that focused on Christ. Luther had no intention of building a new church. He simply wanted to reform the church that he loved. And in fact, the term Lutheran is a derogatory term that people uh, hung on the church um, after Luther uh, split away. What struck his readers as most important was his assertion made in 1520 that before God, all who have been baptized are equal before God. January 3rd, 1521, he was excommunicated by papal bull, by papal announcement, which called him a bore in the vineyard of the Lord, trampling down what God had given the church on earth. April 17, 1517, Luther's famous Here I Stand speech. Luther was summoned to appear before Emperor Charles V and his officials of the German Empire on April 17th and 18th. He refused to deny his writings 
or to change his teachings. He was branded a heretic, which means a false teacher. Heresy is false teaching. And an outlaw, which meant that he could be arrested on sight. His books were ordered burned. And I will read that famous uh, speech for you. Martin, you have not sufficiently distinguished your works. The earlier were bad and the later worse. Your plea to be heard from scripture is the one always made by heretics. You do nothing but renew the errors of Wycliffe and Huss. How will the Jews, how will the Turks, exalt to hear Christians discussing whether they have been wrong all these years? Martin, how can you assume that you are the only one to understand the sense of scripture? Would you put your judgment above that of so many famous men and claim that you knew more than they all? You have no right to call into question the most holy orthodox faith instituted by Christ, the perfect lawgiver, proclaimed throughout the world by the apostles, sealed by the red blood of the martyrs, confirmed by the sacred councils, defined by the church in which all our fathers believed until death and gave to us as an inheritance in which now we are forbidden by the Pope and the Emperor to discuss, lest there be no end of debate. I ask you, Martin, answer candidly and without horns. Do you, or do you not, repudiate your books and the errors which they contain? Luther replied, Since then your majesty and your lordships desire a simple reply. I will answer without horns and without teeth. Unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Amen. In 1529, Luther drafted two catechisms, the large catechism, which is contained in the Book of Concord, and this is for teachers and for parents, and the small catechism, which is for children, which is for young adults, people learning the faith. And the small catechism is what we use to this day in confirmation. June 25th of 1530, the Augsburg Confession, which affirms the basic articles of faith and doctrine, such as the dogma of the Trinity as the central universal Christian affirmation and justification by faith alone as the biblical center of Lutheranism. We believe in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. fifteen thirty six to fifteen ninety three, somewhere in there, Lutheranism becomes the faith of Scandinavia. Luther composed the theological last will and testament, later known as the small called articles. He reaffirmed his belief in the Trinitarian Creed and total trust in what God had done in Christ, rather than what believers can do to earn their salvation. Citing Paul, he confessed that Jesus was handed over to death. For our, trans, for our trespasses, and was raised again for our justification. Gall and kidney stones, angina, insomnia, mind grains, and old age finally overcame Luther in the early morning hours of February 18, 1546, in his native city of Eisleben, and his final words written on a scrap of paper and found in his pocket after death, said, we are beggars. That is true. Luther was a formidable figure. His life and work made a difference in world history. His literary legacy is staggering. He produced more than 450 treaties, more than 3,000 sermons, and 2,600 letters, and nearly 7,000 table talks, which we'll talk about later. Luther's works consist of over 100 volumes, and not everything has yet been traced. We'll stop there. Hope you have a great week, and uh, we'll return next time. Remember to um, send in your questions, if you have, uh, concerning Lutheran 
belief, and practice. May God bless you and keep you as you serve him. Amen. Thank you.